we're going to dive into talking about your audience, your perfect clients. And we're going to talk about how to identify them, figure out where they are and what they want so that you can deliver it to them. And it doesn't have to be clients you already have, but if you have clients already, then I want you to keep them in your mind as we go through the exercises that we're gonna be doing today. So make sure you got a sharp pencil or a pen with ink in it because you're gonna be doing some writing. So when talking about your audience, we're not just talking about the people who randomly followed you. We are talking about your perfect people, your perfect clients, the people who are a joy to work with, the people who are a joy to serve, the people who need you. And this is one of the reasons that buying likes, buying followers, I don't know if y'all have ever heard of people doing that, people do that um, online, is a bad practice. It's why I said having 10,000 people on your email list is just a van vanity number. Doesn't matter if they're not opening your stuff and reading it. It doesn't matter if they're not buying your paintings or signing up for your courses, taking your online workshops. They're only going to be doing that if they're your perfect clients, if they're your perfect people. Doesn't take that many perfect people in order to create a sustainable business. Those perfect clients become your niche. How many of y'all have heard of the term niche before? I did niche workshops when we were doing the success workshop this past January. And we did that in the free Facebook group and we niched people down. And it's a really important concept. We're gonna spend a good bit of time on that today. And here's the reason why. When you know your niche, you're not just speaking to everybody, you're speaking directly to those perfect people. When there is a whole big sea of noise out there, when there are a lot of people online going, buy my stuff, buy my stuff, buy my stuff, you have to be able to stand out. You have to be able to rise above that noise. And the way to do that is to know your niche, know who your perfect people are. So it doesn't matter whether you call it niche or niche. I say niche because I'm Southern. Um, the concept is it's your little slice of people. It's your pocket of people within a bigger field. So we're going to go through some examples of that in just a minute. But the concept is that if you weed out and push away the people who are not your perfect people, it's easier to draw in your perfect people. And there are, there's an idea called the thousand true fans. It's a really important one. And that idea is that knowing your niche is the first step to getting, building your, your thousand true fans. That if you have a thousand true fans, whether it's in person, physical, brick and mortar, or online, you can create a sustainable business. That's all you really have to have. Those thousand true fans, that's not just the people who clicked like on an Instagram post that you made. It's the people who can't wait to open your email. It's the people who can't wait until you release a new limited edition of prints. It's the people who can't wait to sign up for one of your workshops. Those are true fans. So think a great example of that. Think about the Grateful Dead. They were um, possibly one of the great pioneers of um, the new way to market, marketing with content. You know, the Grateful Dead gave their music away and then made their money off of merch and their concerts. 
then they developed an incredibly loyal following. People who had to have shirts that said Grateful Dead. They had to have all of the official stuff. They sold albums, still sell albums. They sold them for a lot of money, but you could download their stuff anytime you wanted to. And the reason people paid for it is because they were deadheads. Deadheads were the Grateful Dead's thousand true fans. They would buy anything the Grateful Dead put out. And the Grateful Dead knew exactly who those people were and what they wanted and what they needed. So Sharon says, when, I, when you say push out, what do you mean by that? I mean, really repel them. I mean, they go, well, she's boring and weird. Or I could care less about marshes and oceans. Let's talk about my people. Um, or why is she painting people? That's kind of boring. Or I really don't want to study watercolor. I don't care about watercolor. So you want to niche down so that people know exactly what you stand for, what you love, and what you want to do. It's one of the reasons I tell people don't paint for the market. That does not work. It's got to be something you have some passion about because people buy based on emotion, not based on, on what they know they need. They buy based on emotion. They connect based on emotion. And if you don't have a passion about what you're trying to promote, people pick up on that in a skinny minute and they walk away. So not everybody is going to love what you do. Some people are going to really hate it. You want to appeal to the people who really love the same kind of things that you're making. Would you push people away by being very specific about what you do? Yeah. So if I say that my paintings are paintings of the Southern landscape, I'm going to push away people who really are more drawn to and want completely non-objective abstract paintings. I don't make completely object, non-objective abstract paintings. I'm pushing them away. Instead, I'm pulling in people who are drawn to the landscape, but not just the landscape, but the Southern landscape. The Southern landscape without peoples in it. So, that's what I mean about being very, very, very specific. And when you have students, you want to pull in people who want to learn what you have to teach, what you have real knowledge about. Don't say that you can teach anything and everything because nobody's good at anything and everything. You're good at one specific thing. So when you're teaching, um, you're going to teach people, I'm going to make this up, Bobby, you're going to teach people who want to paint landscapes in oils from life. You're not going to go run a still life class. You're not going to also run a class on abstract painting. When you do that, you scatter yourself all over the place. So people who say my target market is everyone have a target market that is no one. Your target market's your niche. I had a student one time, it was back when I was still teaching entrepreneurship at, at the college, and they had to create business plans for their final paper every semester. And she put in there for her target market, her niche was everybody on the internet. And she was going to make a million dollars. And she had no data to back it up. It was just a pipe dream. Um, she was real comfortable with getting out of her comfort zone. Bless her heart. But that she had no market because she had not identified what her niche was at all. So narrow it down as much as you can. And when you're looking at your own work, you might like to do still lives. You might like to do landscapes. And you might like to do portraits. Guess what? So do I. But what I primarily market are my landscapes. People don't sign up to my workshops, my painting workshops, to learn how to paint a portrait. They sign up to paint landscapes, to paint plein air specifically, 99.99% .99 of the time. So
So being niche driven means that you go deep rather than broad. And one of the reasons why it's so beneficial to do that online is that it makes you rise up above all of those other people who are real generalists and trying to scattergun it to everybody. So that you rise up above, your head pops up above the, everybody else's head and people who are looking for that specific thing go, oh, there she is. Because they can see you, they can't see all of those other people that are down in the weeds saying, I teach painting workshops. So you wanna be super, super specific, very, very targeted in your marketing so that you rise up above and people can see you. In the online world, your market is global. So one of the things that is a huge big myth that I have to dispel right away, almost every time we have a new cohort in the course, the big course, is that people say, but I can't sell my painting for $2,000 because I live in the boonies and there's, there's no big gallery around where I live. Doesn't matter. Your market is in London, it's in New York, it's in Ottawa, it's in Toronto, it's in LA, it's in Atlanta, it's in Sydney, Australia, it's everywhere. You can ship paintings anywhere. It is not limited geographically anymore. So an artist living in Savannah, Georgia, like me, can ship paintings around the world, which I do. I don't have to be in London to sell a painting to a, a collector in London. They buy it when I release a collection. So your, your market, the big pool you have to draw from is the whole world. And you're going for a little tiny part of it. So Cindy says she's in rural Nebraska. You're fine. You may not find your perfect people in the town that you live in or in the county you live in, but you can find them in South Carolina, you can find them in California, you can find them in Ontario, around the world. They're out there. You just have to find where they're hiding. That's what we're gonna be talking about. You can build your 1,000 true fans so much easier now than you used to be able to when you were geographically limited. You're not limited that way anymore. And you're not gonna have a thousand true fans right away. That's something you have to build up over time, but you build those up and you develop them by connecting, by engaging with them and by building relationships. That's why I said you only have to have your personal email because you're gonna talk to them directly one to one. One to one stands out because most people are barraging people with emails. How many of y'all get 10 emails a day from people trying to sell you stuff? And they'll send multiple emails all in one day. We're gonna do it one to one. Very personally, that's gonna stand out in today's noisy world. So it can absolutely happen. You can be in Nebraska and you can want, have a one-on-one -on -one contact with a client in Ireland and you can be packaging a painting up and sending it out next week. So it does, we're not limited anymore. And you can build up your thousand true fans by having that kind of really close, direct, engaged connection. You sell through relationship. That's why it doesn't feel sleazy and smarmy. So your 1,000 true fans, those are your perfect clients. There's some other phrases that people use to the, as synonyms for niche and perfect people, perfect clients. They call talk about your customer avatar, um, which is like a general overall picture of it. And I just like the term perfect client. I like that better than customer. All of the people who buy from you, whether they're buying paintings or they're students, they're your clients. 
And if you begin to think about the people that you're building relationships with as being clients, even before they buy, it's a whole lot easier to build that kind of tight relationship that makes selling easy because then selling becomes an invitation to take that relationship deeper. And it doesn't feel like you're selling smarmy stuff. A thousand true fans leads to a sustainable business, to something that can keep going on even in challenging times because you have that big global market that you can reach out to. Your niche is scattered around the world. Everybody's not going through the exact same thing at the same time. For example, in the situation we're in right now, there are different sections of the world that are more or less affected. So that if you have that diversified fan base, that diversified um, geographic base to pull from, it means that when things are bad in Europe, your clients say in Australia might not be as bad off. When things are bad in Australia, it might be better in the US. I'm making all that stuff up as far as the locations and where economics are right now. But the entire world doesn't go through the exact same economic straits at the same time. So you build in an insurance system um, into your business when you globalize like that. So when we dive into the niche, we are talking about two different kinds of niches. We're talking about your product or your offer niche, and we're talking about your audience client niche. So the way those two things are different, your product, your offer, this is what people are buying. And it's the easiest part to nail down to begin with. It's what we did to a degree in the niche workshop um, back in January. Talk about what it is that you make. I make blankety blank. That is your product niche. So I make paintings, I make intensely, cut wrong, that, that doesn't sound right. I make light filled paintings of the Southern landscape. That becomes my product niche, my offer niche. Then your audience client niche is for people who love fill in the blank. And we're gonna create both of those statements, both parts of that statement today. So we're gonna create your full niche statement. You might not have all of it worked out by today, but you're gonna have the nuts and bolts of it. And we're gonna do it in two parts. The first is, I make what so that. Second part is, for who so they feel unlike. And what that is, is I make, and then you talk about the category of paintings you make, so that, and I make them so that people can bring the color and the light of the landscape to the walls of their homes. That's the result. For people who love the Southern landscape and environment or Southern landscape and culture, those are my peeps. Now, it doesn't mean I can't sell to other people, and I do, but my core base, my core niche, are people who are in love with the Southern landscape and culture. That's my who. So they feel why. And most of mine want to get back to a landscape they left behind, landscape of their childhood. So the landscape that they remember, that's so that they can feel that space and that light. They, people buy because of feeling, they buy because of emotion. And we're going to dig into why those people love what they love. That's what, what the feeling part is. And then when you look at the unlike, those are the alternatives. So you look at who else is out there, who else is doing stuff that's similar to what you do. 
So it could be the alternatives. Well, and it's an alternative to buying a landscape painting. They could buy an abstract or they could buy a pet portrait or they could buy a landscape by another artist. It could be unlike an artist who paints New England landscapes. So you wanna look at positioning yourself in the bigger niche, the bigger pool. I make what so that result for whom so they feel why, unlike the alternatives. We are gonna dive into niching, which is one of my favorite things to do. The second part of that is your offer, your product, oh, going too fast. We're gonna dive in first to your product offer niche. We're gonna talk about what you make. So we are gonna take a few minutes here. I'm gonna show you how to do this first. And then I'm gonna let y'all have a couple of minutes to kind of find some of this self for yourselves. So to figure out your offer niche, the system I like to use is to go to one of the sites, one of the big online art galleries, and categorize what you do. Use their search engine to figure out what your category is, to narrow yourself down. So I've got a list of them here. Saatchi, Daily Paintworks, U Gallery, Artsy, Zatista, Artspan. There are others out there too. There are a ton of them. The one that I find easiest to use to do this is Saatchi. So let, I'm gonna show y'all how to do this. And then, I'm gonna get y'all to fill this part in. It's real nuts and bolts. It's not any of this sitting around and thinking about, I don't know what it is I make. I don't know what it is I do. How would I describe what I make? It's just cut and dry. We're just gonna write down the type, the style, the subject, the medium, and the material. I make what? It's just a straightforward category. I make paintings of the landscape. We're going to walk through what I do in just a second. So that, the so that is what they're going to buy the painting for. It's the external reason, like people need to fill space on their walls. So this, we're going to come back to that in a second. I'll recap that. We'll walk through that as I fill in what I'm doing for mine, okay? So I want everybody to maybe open another tab and go to Saatchi Art. I've got Saatchi already pulled up and I'm gonna share that screen. And we are going to go niching. So merely we'll niche along. So one of the reasons I love doing this on um, Saatchi is that their search engine is super good. It's really straightforward and easy to use. So the first step is to look up here at the top. Which of these categories, big categories, do you fit into? Do you make paintings? Do you make photographs? Do you make drawings, sculpture, or prints? By prints, they mean both original prints and reproductions. Reproductions generally go over here in limited. So pick one of those. For me, yeah, and your mobile screen is gonna look a little bit different. You may have to go to the hamburger, the hamburger three lines, that's the menu that lets you go to the other options. So I'm going to paintings. Then I get to go, oops, over here on the left. Style is their next one for me to figure out. Where do I fit? and you can pick more than one. And even though it's not the term I like to use, people tend to put the label impressionism on there. Now, one of the things I wanna remind everybody of is that people self-categorize on Saatchi. So you're gonna see some stuff and go, 
how in the world did that get in here? It doesn't fit that category because people pick it themselves. But we're going to use their search engine just as a way to narrow down the categories. And I could also include, let's see what else they have on here that might fit. Contemporary or um, abstract. Mine are more abstracted, so I could include that as well if I wanted to. And then next down is subject matter. Well, that's easy. I do landscapes. But they also have some other things in here that you might want to narrow it down with, like nature. Um, they have the beach, they have florals, they have seascapes. So you can get very specific on those. You can dig really closely in there, like Anne, you could pick garden. Um, you can get, um, if you paint mainly the ocean, you could specify that you do seascapes. So get it as narrow as you can there on the subject. And you can see how long that goes on. There are a lot of options there. Then scroll down to medium. I'm working predominantly in oil. Not just oils, but mainly in oils. And material, most of mine are on panel. And you can, it's useful to think about what your price range is, but it doesn't have to go into your basic niche. So Sheila, for your national parks, that, that's landscape. You're talking about landscape there as far as the subject matter goes. So when I fill mine out, when I'm looking back at the things that I need to include for mine, I'm making paintings, that would be the type. The style is impressionism or abstract representational. The subject matter is landscape. I can get it more specific. I can say Southern landscape and in oils on wood panels. So I make paintings of the Southern landscape in an abstract representational style in oils on wooden panel, on wood panels. That's my category niche. That's my product offer niche. So it's not something I have to labor over and you can start out a little bit more general and then gradually see if you can narrow it down. So the form is just the type, the style, the subject, the medium, and the material. So if you've got a, a body of work that is really narrow, then, then you can get hyper-specific when it gets to the subject matter. Um, and it doesn't have to be that you emphasize the subject. You can emphasize the style more. You can emphasize the approach. You can say, I make paintings of a wide range of subjects using heavily impasto strokes or heavy impasto focused colors in an abstract represent abstracted representational or, or abstract representational style. So you can say clearly that you have a wide range of subjects, but what you've narrowed down on and focused on is that very abstracted, um, heavily impasto texture. So you wanna just narrow it down in some form as much as you can, because people who love your paintings are gonna love the tactile quality of the service. Impasto appeals, appeals to this. So when my daughter was a, a little girl and my granddaughter does the same thing. Her fingers went like this when she went into a store. I had to tie her basically into a buggy in the grocery store because her fingers went like this. She wanted to touch everything. People like my daughter want 
stuff that has texture to it. And so people like her are going to be attracted to stuff that has impasto and rich surface texture. So you want to get as specific about what you do as you can. I would think about too, what is your, what is your top selling subject matter? Doesn't mean you're not doing other stuff, but what's the big category that you could put on your main subject matter? I used to require that students would write reports when I taught art history. They had to go look at art and they had to write a, a report that analyzed the artwork. And they had to go through a description of the artwork. They had to write about how the artist used composition, the elements of composition, about how the artist used style. Then they had to talk about the subject matter and they had to talk about the content or the meaning. So as y'all try to narrow it down, try to hit on as many of those things as you can and it'll make it more descriptive. And the more that you can get descriptive, the more you're gonna pull in your perfect people because people are attracted to the way you describe your work as much as they're attracted to your work. And Catherine told the story of her painting and her audience was drawn to the story of her painting and that helped to sell it. And Kim tells the story of her paintings and it draws her clients in and it sells it. CL told the story of her flowers or peony paintings and it pulled people in they were drawn to the story and every time they look at the painting it reminds them of the story of the painting so as much of that descriptive stuff as you can start getting in there the better off you're going to be it's going to make it easier for you to write content later that draws people in i'm going to be writing some content tomorrow and saturday so maybe journal some um, this evening about how you would describe one of your painting and get as much rich language in there as you can. So get things that describe colors, that describe texture, describe shapes, describe everything you can think of that nails down your painting. So think about that you're describing your painting to somebody who cannot see it. And that's what I mean by getting really, really, really descriptive. And, you know, jurors, that's a whole nother thing. Um, artist statements and jury statements, show statements, exhibition statements, that's for a different audience. You are talking directly to your perfect people. You're not talking to your gallerist and you're not talking to a curator and you're not talking to the art critic for the local paper. You're talking directly to your perfect people. Consider your audience. And when we're talking to your perfect people, you're trying to share what you love with them. So you want to use the language that is more emotional and more descriptive. I want y'all to think about this as dating. So we are looking for people that we're gonna date. Your paintings are gonna date them. And you gotta use that language that's more emotional in order to make that kind of connection. And think of selling a painting as marriage. You wanna marry your clients. That made it sound a little weird, but you know what I mean. You need to build up that emotional connection there. I also think it's important that you become known for a certain kind of thing because that makes your marketing so much easier. It also makes it easier to find your perfect people. If you scattergun it and you make paintings of, you make abstract paintings that are completely non-objective, you make landscape paintings over here, and then you do, that are real representational, and then you do fauvist portraits, you're gonna have a hard time marketing all of the above. Pick one and market that first. Doesn't mean you have to let go of all that other stuff, but you've gotta market in a very focused way 
and you can't do it if you're trying to market three different niches at the same time because they have three different audiences. So if you've got radically different styles for different subjects, pick one for right now. Don't try to do them all. Um, how would you handle different series of paintings? So I'll give you an example. I was posting in another painting group and I tagged my friend Nancy Medina in there. So I know some of y'all are familiar with Nancy's work. Nancy is known for paintings of flowers. In fact, she calls herself the flower painter. So Nancy is primarily known for rich, intense, brightly colored paintings of flowers, not just general still lives, flowers. And the painting that she posted in the thread that we were talking in had a rabbit in the lower left-hand corner. It was exquisite. It was a gorgeous rabbit. She's as good painting animals as she is painting flowers. Painting animals is not her niche. Painting flowers is. But she talks in her blog posts, in her videos, with her clients, with her perfect people, about her great love of animals. She has dogs, pugs. So she loves her pugs. And she talks about them. People who follow her feel like they know her dogs. And they appear in her paintings occasionally. But that's not her niche. Doesn't mean she can't do it. And when she does it, she does it brilliantly. That rabbit glowed. Its ears were exquisite. Um, but it's not what she's known for. I mean, she can still do them. And I, she should. So she's not marketing just some paintings of animals right now, she should. And I think there comes a point after you've established the main niche, product offer niche, where you can branch out and go broad again. But you have to become known for one thing first. So for example, Michelle, what I would market first would be your landscapes. That's your big niche that everybody knows you for. So market those online first and then market the small animals on metal leaf. Because then you'd be doing what Nancy's doing, known for flowers, but also a damn good animal painter. She's a good painter, but she does gorgeous animals. And she can sell those and she can have a whole nother niche that she's targeting. And there'll be some crossover because there'll be people who just love how she handles color. There'll be people who love how she handles brush work, but they're really two different niches. Does that make sense? We have a visitor in here. I have critters too. Nancy's not the only one. So um, example, look at the, this very first line, just the, the basic six of the grid. And what's the common thread through here? Intense color, color scheme. So you're representational, but you're not a hyper realist. I see brush strokes in there. They're intimate, intimate personal moments. So you use bright, intense color and contrast to capture intimate moments using loose, soft brush work brushwork so that they feel we're going to come back to that part so that they feel relaxed they feel a sense of calm it's because of the space that you're creating there in the painting now on a an extra that's their internal thing you're changing externally um it depends on the size but you're bringing an intimate view into their home. And all artists, all of us who make artwork, when we are delivering it to a collector in their home, we're transforming their interior space. We're bringing light and color to it. It might be you're bringing the natural world inside their home. Um, you're bringing a landscape in when they can't go out. 
Do you see where I'm going with that? So we get to those more specific things down the road. Yeah, especially when we can't go out. So if you're a landscape painter, you've got a big role to play right now. Um, and one of the differences too, think about small scale paintings, big scale paintings, small scale sculptures, big, big scale sculptures. So small scale is intimate. So you're making intimate views on an intimate scale. So it feels more one-on-one. -on -one. Um, when you make a big painting, you're creating a window into another world. You're creating a dramatic statement. So think about scale when you're talking about your product offer niche. Think about how people are gonna use your painting in their home. What reason would they buy? And that gets us to the so that part in a little bit. And switch back for a second to the offer statement. Once you have written down the I make, then I want you to string it together into an I make statement. So think back to the earlier niche statement. Let me go back to that one. I think I may have it in the next one. There we go. The full niche statement, I make what so that. That's the result. So we're just talking about the what and the result. We're talking about the physical need that it satisfies. And you're fixing a problem, a real physical problem. People buy art to fix a problem. They need something hanging on the wall. They need art on note cards. They need art on diaries. They need reproductions because they can't afford a painting. They need sculpture to go on a table. They need a sculpture for the garden. They need, you're solving a problem. So I want you to say, I make what so that, and that's the result. So I want everybody to write down their I make statement. I make what so that, the result. The result is called the transformation. So when you get into online marketing, the online marketing world or just marketing in general, the result that you deliver to your client is called the transformation. It's how their life changes. And their life changes in external ways. They now have a painting to go on the wall and it changes internal ways, they now feel peace or they feel less anxiety. So right now we're just dealing with the external stuff, the really easy to identify stuff. So I want everybody to take about three minutes to write down the, the very clear nuts and bolts I make statement. So it doesn't have to be perfect and it doesn't have to be in sentences. Um, it can just be a string of words for right now, but I want you to get something down on paper. So just keep it super simple. So I used to write for newspapers and magazines and my editors, because I love words and I came out of academia. So I had a tendency to put big words into what I wrote. And I can remember my editor from the, the regional, big regional paper going, Mary, you got to write on a fifth grade level so that the average person can understand it. And you want to use really conversational language so that when you're writing for your perfect people, it sounds like what you would say on the phone to them. So you don't have to worry about perfect grammar. You don't have to worry about correct punctuation. You can use ellipses all over the place. I do it all the time. Um, it makes it sound more like the way you talk to regular people. So make sure you do that. And remember for the offer niche, when you're talking about what you're making, you're talking about the physical external description, not internal emotional feelings. That comes in the second part. Just want you to get that physical description down. 